The former nurse, Lucy Letby, has been found guilty of murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Between June 2015 and June 2016, babies who seemed to be doing reasonably well would suddenly collapse. Lucy Letby was the common factor. The verdicts make the 33-year-old Britain's most prolific baby killer. This was a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It's now a podcast about one of the worst serial killers in modern times. At 12.52pm on Friday, August the 18th, 2023, we brought you the news that a neonatal nurse was guilty of killing babies in her care. After a trial lasting for over 10 months and more than 110 hours of painstaking deliberation, the jury decided that Lucy Letby murdered seven babies at the Countess of Chester Hospital and she tried to kill six more. She was cleared of two further charges of attempted murder and the jury could not reach verdicts on six further allegations. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail. I've been in court throughout and have reported on the case as it developed. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week we've examined what's happened and brought you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. So in our verdict episode, which outlined the guilty verdicts in this case against Lucy Letby, we played you a few clips of some of the interviews that we've had with the detectives who've worked on this case for the past six years. Yeah, so we've spoken to many of the senior officers from Cheshire Police who were involved in this investigation and they were kind enough to give us their time and sit down and talk to us about exactly how she was brought to justice. One of the most interesting interviews that we did was with the detective who sat opposite Lucy Letby, questioning her for over 20 hours. Welcome to episode 54 Questioning a killer. So, Liz, as we've said and as we know, you have spent pretty much every day in Court 7 at Manchester Crown Court listening to all of this evidence unfold. One of the most anticipated days in the trial came around seven months in, and that was the day Lucy Letby started to give evidence in her defence, something we didn't think she was going to do. Yeah, we weren't sure. You might remember we talked about this on the podcast earlier on. Nobody was really sure whether she would actually go into the witness box and be questioned by her, Casey, and the prosecution, Casey. But she did. She decided that she would give evidence. And it's fair to say that that was the first time that most people, certainly many of the journalists and no doubt all the public that were watching in Court 8, heard her speak for the first time Mm. and it was really, really intriguing and we were all interested to see exactly how she would come across. But one person who had heard her speak at length by that point was Detective Sergeant Danielle Stonia. She was the officer who spent hour after hour interviewing Lucy Letby when she was arrested and in our exclusive interview with Danielle, she talked us through what it was like to question someone that she knew could go down in history as one of the worst murderers in modern times. So I'm Detective Sergeant Danielle Stonia working on Operation Hummingbird and I've been involved in the investigation since 2018 as a family liaison officer but also the interviewing officer for Lucy Letby. So we were really interested to know a little bit more about that whole experience. Mm -hmm. What was she like in those interviews? She's been quite cold and quite controlled in the witness box, she seemed to us. I'm interested to know whether that's what she was like in the police station as well. I was involved in the interview process for the interviews that took place in 2019 and then again uh, in 2020. Back in 2019 was the very first time I met her. She was arrested and brought into police custody and I was actually standing in the custody suite when she was brought in by the arresting officers. And I say that's the first time I'd seen her in person. I was really thinking about what the next couple of hours, couple of days were were gonna entail. And obviously you look at a person and think, right, this is gonna be the person who I'm gonna be spending time with, asking questions and obviously finding out 
more about her involvement at that time, whether she was involved or wasn't in uh, what she'd been arrested for. It was quite surreal to see her in person. She'd already been interviewed, so I had watched some of the previous interviews for a bit of experience, so I I could see how she would react uh, in questions. That doesn't mean to say that she was going to present the same again, Mm -hmm. bearing in mind she already knew by this point what we were investigating and obviously knew herself any involvement that she'd had. Again, I'd say from from watching her and then to meeting her, it was, yeah, it was it was surreal, to be honest. You said you had your interview head mm. on, but I wonder, how do you prepare for something like that? What's the training? You, at that point, 2019, you knew what you were looking at. You'd had the evidence back from the medical experts to say inflicted harm. So you knew what this might be becoming. So this is high stakes, isn't it? So I'm fortunate that with previous experience within the police, I've interviewed on a a number um, of cases. Uh, I worked on the major investigation team, which predominantly dealt with um, murder investigation, homicides. So preparation is definitely the key. As you say, you know, we had the evidence come through from all the medical experts. So we, uh, myself and my colleague, had spent weeks preparing for these interviews. So we read every single statement. We'd um, looked at all the medical records. So there is a lot of planning that goes into the interviews because it is a really intense process. You know, you're, you're in quite a small room. She's got a solicitor present. There's two interviewing officers. Although she's spoken the first time round, you don't know that she's going to speak the second time round. She could just go no comment like a lot of people do. Part of our planning process is looking at what may happen. So, you know, first thing, is she going to talk? You know, is she going to answer all the questions we put to her? Or is she going to only answer a couple? And as you say, then go no comment, which they aren't really entitled to do. Um, But we, um, as interviewing officers, are still entitled to continue asking those questions, even if she chooses to go no comment. Because the way we see it is she may then decide for whatever reason to answer one particular question, whatever that could be. It may trigger something for her or she thinks, actually, I do want you, I do want to talk to you about that particular area or topic or, or answer that question. Um, but the rest of it, I, I don't want to. And the experience in this particular one, 2019, 2020, she mm. spoke to you? She did, yeah, she, she did. She spoke to us right from the, the very off, really, um, from the first question that we posed to her. Um, on both sets of interviews, she spoke. And from that point, you kind of think, well, if she's spoken now, she is going to continue to speak throughout. Why do you think she spoke to you? That's what I want to know. A lot of people who are facing such serious charges just don't speak to the police, do they? And she gave evidence in the witness box, which... You know, again, a lot of people may, might have been quite surprised by. I think what we have to remember is, obviously, we're there as interviewing officers, but we're there as investigators as well. And so for me, you know, we're putting the evidence to you and this is your opportunity to tell us any involvement you've had or not had. You know, so it's like if you're saying to me, this is not me, I am not responsible for, you know, for the allegations that you're putting towards me and the evidence you're giving me, that is not me. I have not done those things. Well, do you know what? Okay, tell me what lines of inquiry to follow to, to prove that you aren't involved. So you kind of make it a two-way thing, really. You know, you're letting them know why we think they may have involvement, but also, right, okay, then, if it isn't you, you you tell us. Tell us where you were during these times or, or tell us where to go f- to look for that bit of evidence that would assist in proving your innocence. And so I think in answer to your question is why do I think she spoke? I think she potentially spoke because she gave full accounts in the first set of interviews, were then put into her more kind of witness statements and the medical evidence. And I think she obviously wants to hear that. Potentially, if she was going to go no comment, were we going to disclose further information? I don't know. You know, she, she's she's still yes, of you as yes, well. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So you know, we, we may then be more inclined to say, well, okay, well, you know, such and such a person has said this. You know, well, mm-hmm. tell us why they would have said that then. What we've said, Liz, from being in, in court and just watching her give evidence is just that calm, not easily rattled. What was the demeanour, and was it surprising? So the Lucy Letby you saw in court giving evidence for me was the Lucy Letby I interviewed. Her tone, her approach to answering the questions, even so much as kind of 
the pauses that she gave as well was very much the same. You know, some of the evidence that, and the, the statements that we were putting to her are really, really graphic in, in detail. You know, and for me, kind of the allegations in itself are, are horrific. Mm-hmm. Some people would be flipping the tables, throwing the chairs, banging the doors down, saying, you know, look, you need to go and speak to such and such. You know, mm-hmm. I shouldn't be here. You know, that this is completely wrong. Um, whereas she was calm. She was quite cool about it and she answered the questions she was confident she talked but for me there was little emotion but what we have to be careful of as interviewing officers is you can't read too much into that because everybody reacts so differently as we said before did she tell you anything or give you anything that you thought I think we might just have something there in all honesty I don't You know, particularly if you're looking at the way she's reacting to to hearing the evidence, and particularly this is like her colleagues, you know, that she's worked with that have provided evidence and, you know, discussing, you know, potentially her involvement in murder and and attempted murders, you know, and and hearing that about your own colleagues, if you aren't responsible, like, I don't know how I would feel, you know, and for me, you kind of look at her and, as I say, there there was just nothing from her. She knew the severity of what, you know, she's potentially been alleged of doing. For me, you'd then start to feel the walls closing in a little bit. She knows yeah. that you haven't gone away and yeah, no. and thought, oh, there's nothing in this. You know, you're arresting her a second time, then a third time. Yeah. What was she like the third time when you got to the kind of charging point? You have to read out, obviously, the date, the baby that's involved, the allegation, and then you read out the act and section. So imagine doing that on 22 separate occasions. And after each one, she she has to acknowledge the charge. You know, you have to stand up and listen as these have been read out. I bet a lot of people crumple to the floor, do they? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So you see all, like I say, you see all kinds of emotions, you know. You do, you do have people who immediately, the natural thing to do is to cry. Mm. You know, the natural thing is to do is to cry and then it becomes uncontrollable. You know, you have other people who will almost just put the fingers in their ears and just completely ignore it and show no interest in it whatsoever. It's the same Lucy Letby we've seen. Yeah. It's the same Lucy Letby. She has this ability to mentally switch off. I have got to say, these interviews with Lucy Letby has been like nothing I've ever interviewed for before. Mm. Nothing. Mm. You know, I think it was it was intense. I think it was challenging at times. I think I certainly felt the pressure you know because for us we have to remain confident calm we have to remain particularly focused you know and as the amount of time goes on you naturally become more weary you mm. know but you you are you your adrenaline is is yeah, pumping oh god time. throughout the whole time because with em- every answer she gives like your mind's ticking well, like it's... well it's like where am I going to go with this next question and then then also you're thinking okay how is that going to fit into the investigation now what do, you know mm. later down the line does that give us some more lines of inquiries to do does that help prove or disprove her involvement she killed three babies in a fortnight in June 2015 mm-hmm. and People started asking a few questions, but nobody put two and two together, really. And then as the year went on, more and more babies started collapsing. And, you know, there was a bit of suspicion about her, but she wasn't ever pulled to one side and said, we've noticed you're on duty every single time. So, you know, who knows what she was thinking? And I actually think afterwards, you know, when... When she's moved into the admin role, she has the gumption and the bravado almost to put in a grievance. What you've got to remember with, about Lucy Letby is, and we've seen that in the text messages and the Facebook messages, she was at the time a valued member of staff. Mm. She was in the thick of it all the time. She was receiving praise, you know, by her, her colleagues. Families appreciated her time and help looking after their babies she was always in a position you know if somebody had phoned in sick or they needed extra shifts covering it seems to me that you know Lucy Letby was somebody that you could go to and and you know you, you'd be sure that she'd turn up and she'd be available and I think all this gave her the confidence and um, that she was a valued member at that time of the team. Well actually what you've just described which is the most ironic thing when you think about it is that she was a safe pair of hands for them. Yeah, but with a safe pair of hands comes opportunity. It's that thing, isn't it? You know, you, you get a long, away with something for, for so long, do you become more confident in the acts yeah. that you're doing? In that situation, you trust them completely. Yeah, absolutely. You, you would never suspect that your colleague was harming babies, particularly in a neonatal unit. You know, every parent that, that entered 
that department is vulnerable. Yeah. They're entirely in the hands of those staff, you know, the professionals, and, and they take it for granted almost that they're going to have their best interests at heart and they're going to help their baby as much as possible. And at the time, Lucy Letby was going to be that person. The parents is bad enough, but also the the, the members of staff yeah. that, you know, have to carry on working and have to carry on providing treatment for these babies now. But also, the same members of staff who saved so many of these yeah. babies' lives as well. Yeah. How yeah. traumatic is that? Yeah. It's horrific. It is absolutely horrific. And you do have to feel for her colleagues. They must feel that their trust, their judgment as well. Mm. You know, because they would never suspect and they think, you know what, I'm they may think, you know, I'm quite a good judge of character and, and I've got trust and, and confidence in my colleagues. And particularly a lot of those times, you know, we've heard the evidence of collapses and, and you know, when um resuscitation's involved and, and I wouldn't dread to think what the atmosphere must have been like in those nurseries when they are resuscitating, you know, a baby. It must be horrific. And everybody's got a role and they're all pulling together and working. And Lucy Leppy was in the thick of it. And the thought of that, thinking that, well, actually, she put that baby in that position, position in, the first, in the first place, but then is a really key role in trying to revive them. But, you know, it took some of them a long time to accept that she was responsible because they just didn't want to believe it because she pulled the wall over everyone's eyes. Yeah. You know, for me, Lucy Leppy is quite indescribable. I would say that if you were to walk past her in the street, there's nothing distinctive about her. For me, she wouldn't particularly stand out. And again, is that why she's allowed herself the opportunity to to have done what she's mm. done, you know, because she's kind of blended in so well. She's blended into that neonatal unit, you know. She's made friends with some of the families, you know, the colleagues, you know, and she's always keeping herself abreast of what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis, even when even she when wasn't on duty, yeah. you know, when she was off duty, I'm quite confident you could have said to her at any point, right, what, what babies you've got on this unit at this time and who's caring for them? Yeah. She was always in the thick of it and, you know, her life was being a neonatal nurse. Being proven guilty and being held responsible for one thing, but the one thing Lucy Letby will always hold is the why and only she can ever answer that. And I think that's the most... Difficult and hard thing for the families to live with because that is the one thing they want to know is why. Yeah. You know, what you've got to bear in mind is some of these families initially was thinking, well, you know, is it is it me? You know, is it is it about us as parents yeah, as, as opposed to her? Yeah, as absolutely. Like pastor in the corridor. You, absolutely. You'd be constantly thinking something that you did while you were there. Well, like I say, you know, the, these, you know, parents have been through, you know, a hard time with with pregnancy and then obviously labor and then actually giving birth and then realizing that your baby's poorly you know what that must do to you mm. kind of you know your your mental state and your emotions and that's what i mean it makes you vulnerable it makes you so vulnerable and so they're thinking you know have i said something to her have i upset her have i been overbearing have i been challenging you know i've never even considered that that the parents might blame themselves mm. for almost offending her or mm. upsetting her or mm. making her angry so she targeted their child yeah. i think parents like you say are just com completely racking their brains as to think why why would anybody you know i'm not saying even you could take it as far as not even a nurse why would anybody yeah. another human being harm a baby why, why would anybody do that i think you've done 18 years in the force and 10 years as an interviewer and I know you've interviewed some pretty high profile, fairly notorious people, as well as Lucy Letbin. I wonder whether you could talk us through a few of those. Yes. So two that particularly stick in my mind. One is Barry Bennell. He was a football coach working at Crew Alexander. He committed horrendous sexual offences. He, he was a serial perpetrator. There was, you know, a large number um, of victims involved. And um, so when he was arrested, obviously his interviews were conducted over a, a number of days and a number of hours. They were really challenging interviews to, to do with him. Another one that sticks in mind is Ian Nord. Mm. He was a, a police officer at the time when he committed, again, horrific sexual offences um, and, again, was a serial perpetrator, a serial offender. And also those interviews, yeah, took place over several days, you know, which are hard and, and the challenging. You know, there's a lot of information that you're trying to 
process during those interviews. Um, you're constantly thinking about the next questions that you're going to ask and weighing up the answers that you're going to give and are you going to take the interview in a slightly different direction. Mm-hmm. It does get tiring after a while just because you're so focused and concentrating. I understand it's intense and it's mm-hmm. stressful and you, you're constantly you know, listening and thinking of what's, what's next and what the aim of this interview is. But emotionally, as a human being, you, you've obviously interviewed some pretty horrible people. Mm. Do you just kind of, I don't know, put it in a box? Do you just put your professional head on and then go home and use somebody else? Or how do you, is there ways of dealing with being surrounded by pretty vile human beings? I suppose everybody deals with it in different ways and has different coping mechanisms. As you say, you know, when I'm in work, you have your your professional head on there. You, you're there to, to kind of do your job and particularly you want to do it to your, your best of your ability. And part of that for me is kind of having the ability to, to switch on and off. So for me, kind of when I leave it at the end of my shift, whenever my day is, it's when I'm driving home, you know, in the moment I walk through the door, I am able to switch off and carry on with my home life that always doesn't happen you know sometimes to have had long days you know and as you say some of the stuff that I'm dealing with or, or interviewing over it is hard so you just have to have time to kind of process it yeah and then move on um it isn't always the case and isn't always as easy to do but over the years I've kind of worked out kind of coping mechanisms and strategies and I do have the ability to do that and Obviously, in this case, Lucy Letby's case, she was interviewed for, I think I tossed it up, it was over 21 hours, over eight days, three different times. So that is must be pretty intense and exhausting. Yeah, um, yeah, it was, it was. We were prepared, though. We, we knew that, you know, she was going to be interviewed for a large number of of hours I suppose part of that was depending on how much she was going to talk you know if she wasn't going to engage with us or or give us as much information as she did naturally that would have cut the interview process down but we were expecting to to spend a lot of time with her you know planning and preparation is the key for that but yeah it was it was it, it, it was hard and particularly as we were getting to the end of the process it was difficult but you know your adrenaline and whatever else kind of keeps you going with that really. And obviously you played Lucy Letby in the kind of role play in the in the courtroom. So you almost flipped your role, didn't you? So the Nick Johnson Casey played uh, you essentially asking the questions and you were asked to be Lucy Letby in the courtroom for the purpose of the jury so they could hear her interviews. And just tell us about that. And she actually didn't really want you there, did she? When we started reading out um, the transcripts, as you said, it was myself and uh, Casey Nick Johnson who did it. When I very first started reading out Lucy Letby's replies to my questions, it felt, did feel a bit strange to start with. Um, but, it you know, it was a long process. Obviously, you were there in court and I was in the witness box um, for a number of days. And again, it's just having that ability to kind of switch off and, and do the role and the job that you're there for. And it was a case of just reading off the transcript, but it did actually take me back to to the interviews, you know, and some of the answers that she gave, you know, it did take me back to the time that we were sat in that interview room over at custody. Um, but also it, it's hard for me because of who was in court. Obviously there were families in court listening to her answers. And um, as a family liaison officer, I'd built up a rapport with some of those families. So for me kind of playing that role and then hearing the answers she gave, because a lot of it, that was the first time they'd heard this information. And it was almost felt like me providing it to them, her answers, her explanations for things. And at times it, you know, it it felt strange. But as I say, you know, as a police officer, you're there to, to do your role. As you say, it's my job. It was difficult, but overall I'm you know, it went well. But she didn't want you there. I think she felt um, uneasy by me being in court, but there could have been a number of reasons for that. I, as I say, you know, I'm, I interviewed her, I spent a number of days with her and whether that caused, you know, kind of maybe some flashbacks for her, whether it took her back to a time of when she was arrested that she struggled to deal with, whether she knew I was the person that was going to read out those transcripts and, and go through those interviews and, and give that information to the court and the families were there. You know, it, I'm can only guess that it must have been difficult for her to to have seen me and for me to have been in that courtroom or is it just another part of her trying to manipulate and decide that actually you know this is you know this is my courtroom and actually I'd rather you not be there 
Potentially, yeah. Potentially it could be, you know, could it be that, as you say, you know, that this is her time, the trial is, is about her mm -hmm. and she felt uneasy about other people who were in there and the roles or the parts they were going to play over the, the nine, ten month trial. Yeah, so there's lots of words you can use to describe her and I know your feelings are very strongly about this is about these families. Yeah. Yeah. But I wonder, from sitting, from being the person who sat with her for hour after hour yeah. after hour, and now in court for 10 months, whether you have formed a view of her. Mm. I don't think I will ever be able to comprehend what Lucy Letby has actually done. I think the more and more you think about it, you know, you think of all these babies that she's hurt and that she's harmed and the grief that she's caused these families. I think the more you try to, to maybe... Yeah, you, you can never understand it, but the more you try to accept it, it, it becomes more, more horrific, I guess, really. You know, just to think that anybody, another human being, could do that, you know, I mean, that, that is evil. What she has done is evil. You know, she's killed people, but not only that, what she's left and the harm that she's done and the upset she's caused to those families, it's horrendous. <laughs> So as we heard there, Liz, Danielle was the detective who spoke to Lucy Letby probably the most. And as you heard, Lucy Letby cooperated. She wasn't obstructive, she wasn't rude, she cooperated. But what she talks about is that detached way she yeah. behaved. Yeah. She talks about the way she was quite calm in the interviews and she was quite cool and quite measured. And that's certainly how she came across in the witness box, you know, she didn't break down very often. You know, we saw a few tears when Dr. A came to give evidence in the dock that was before she gave evidence, actually. And then we also saw a few tears when pictures of her house were shown mm. on the screens in the courtroom. But she was pretty calm and cool throughout. And Danielle said that that was a feature of Lucy Letby, that when she looks back, struck her as, you know, highly unusual because... You know, she's interviewed a lot of serious criminals and there's a, often a lot of emotion from people. Yeah, I mean, she's interviewed some of the country's worst criminals. Barry Burnell, convicted of abusing young boys involved in, in football. Ian Nord, a police officer accused and convicted of the gravest of crimes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Danielle Stonia has sat opposite those people and been involved in their conviction you know, her, her work has, has, has helped to convict them, ultimately. But interesting then that she described her experience with Lucy Letby as surreal. I mean, I think that's true for a lot of the detectives involved in this case that we've spoken to. None of them can quite believe that they have been part of someone that's committed such terrible, terrible crimes, you know, it's easy to look back and criticise the hospital in a way and say, you know, why did nobody pick up on mm. what she was doing? But nobody wanted to believe that a nurse was capable of this. You know, obviously the police built a, a solid case against her and they knew that she was responsible. But still, I think they find it hard to understand how someone could have done this. And I think that's why Danielle talks about it being surreal because Lucy Letby will go down in history as one of the most awful serial killers in modern times and to think that you've spent a lot of time in your work with someone mm. capable of that is bizarre. Yeah and I mean the weight of the responsibility mm -hmm. on her shoulders in that interview and of course she's not on her own she's got a team behind her another detective in the room but obviously she talked about the hours and hours and days and weeks of planning for that interview before she was brought in. And trying to almost be one step ahead of, and anticipate what, what if she says this, is she going to do this, and um, what am I going to ask after that? She talks about that quite a yeah, lot. Yeah, she does. Something to say about Danielle Stonia is that not only is she a highly skilled and experienced investigator and interviewer, she's also a family liaison officer. So she's also working with the families in this yeah, case. She's she... highly invested. That's it for episode 55. 
You can catch more of our post-verdict episodes on Mel Plus or wherever you get your podcasts. You can give us a rating and you can share the podcast. You can also follow me at Liz Hull or send us an email at thetrialofluciletby at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or follow me at Radio Caroline. See you then. <laughs>